The 555 Timer. According to Wikipedia, it is the most popular integrated circuit of all time. And I can believe it. You remember multi-vibrators, your A-stable, mono-stable, and bi-stable. Well, this timer is all of them at once. And you can even change which one it is as you're using it. A-stable means it has no stable state and it wiggles back and forth all the time. Square wave generator. Monostable, it has one stable state. You can kick it out of it and it'll wiggle back in. A timer, a debouncer, a frequency divider. Or bi-stable, it has two stable states and it goes back and forth according to your direction. That's right, it's a latch as well. People say flip-flop, it's not a flip-flop. A flip-flop has a clock or enable signal. It's a latch. People use the term interchangeably, don't worry about it. You'll hear flip-flop all the time. But yes, it can do everything from generate a square wave to run as a timer to store a bit of memory. And the best part is it's actually surprisingly easy to understand. So I'm going to do what's called a functional block diagram. The actual chip is going to be made however the company making the chip wants to make it, however it wants to lay out the transistors in order to get the desired functionality. But the way I'm going to do it is if you had separate parts, how you would put those parts together to make it work. So even though it's not going to be exactly how any particular chip is laid out, it's going to be how the chip works. So they won't have made the chip like this because that would be inefficient, but they could have. That's what a functional block diagram is. An inefficient but understandable way to describe a chip. So let's take it piece by piece. A 555 timer has eight pins. Let's start with two. Let's say we have VCC or VDD and we have ground. VCC is collector voltage, VDD is drain voltage. This is just your positive supply, depending on if your chip is made with BJTs or MOSFETs. And ground is your circuit ground, your zero. You don't give this negative voltage, you just have your, your regular, like positive and negative of the battery or whatever. The first actual component of the chip is three resistors. These three resistors inside the chip again in the functional block diagram, will all be the same value. All three of these will be exactly, well, close enough to exactly the same value. If you're using BJTs, they'll be probably about 5K, 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 which is not where the chip gets its name. That's not why it's called the 555. As it turns out, it's called the 555 because people who are making the chip were working on a 500 series and 555 was available and they liked it, so they picked it. It's a complete coincidence. If you're using MOSFETs in the chip, this is going to be much higher, like 100K each, for example. But the point is, all three of them are exactly the same value, which means it's just a voltage divider. And so here you have two thirds of the voltage and here you have one third of the voltage because here is zero thirds and here is three thirds. So that's the start of the chip. It just has a voltage divider right there. And if you want to find out if your chip is using BJTs or not, just put your resistance meter over your VCC and ground pins. For mine, it measured about 15K ohms. So three of those, 5K, mine is using BJTs. The second piece of the puzzle is what is called a comparator. Basically, you compare two voltages and you want to have, ideally, a logical one if the first voltage is bigger than the second and a logical zero if the second is bigger than the first or the first is less than a second and if they're equal it just wiggles either way. Well that just sounds like a differential amplifier doesn't it? When we're designing this it doesn't much matter that it's actually one or zero or high or low. All that matters is we're turning on and off transistors or logic gates or whatever. So just two op amps. Two op amps. Now you might say an op amp is an integrated circuit. It's not a fundamental component like a resistor or transistor is. It's important to enough and ubiquitous enough to have its own circuit symbol. I think that we can decide an op amp is a basic circuit element. So two op amps. We don't need resistors to configure them or anything. All we care about is you've got your non-inverting input minus your inverting input. If the non-inverting is bigger than the inverting, you'll get greater than zero voltage. If your non-inverting is less than your inverting, then a smaller minus a larger is negative, so you get the negative. Now, we're not giving this a negative voltage. It gets VCC on one side and ground on the other. So it's going to output because of its crazy gain. You're going to get VCC or ground, essentially. So essentially, it's just a logical out. Nice, simple comparator. The two-thirds voltage here 
connects to the inverting input of this comparator. The one-third voltage here connects to the non-inverting. So this is using two-thirds of VCC as negative. And this is using one-third of VCC as positive. That's what we're comparing to. So that's why the voltage divider. Now let's add two pins. Let's have a pin called threshold and a pin called trigger. The idea is that trigger is a signal that starts timing and threshold is a signal that stops timing. Now there's 800 million ways to hook up this chip, so that's a gross simplification. But roughly speaking, that's why they're named that. That's just the name. So trigger is hooked up to the negative here. Threshold is hooked up to the positive there. So how do these work? We decided that this is two thirds of VCC. Whenever threshold is greater than two thirds VCC, we get a high. Whenever threshold is lower, we get a low. So this is checking if the voltage being given at the threshold pin is bigger than this spot. Down here, it's a less than operation. If one third VCC is greater than the trigger, then we get a high. If trigger is greater than VCC, we get a low because a positive minus a negative where the negative is bigger. So smaller minus greater is negative. So that's going to amplify down to the lowest voltage it's getting, which is ground. So basically this comparator is true logically when threshold is bigger than that. This comparator is true when trigger is smaller than this threshold. So there's a sandwich here. There's, there's a sandwich, two pieces of bread and meat. Threshold should be higher or trigger should be lower. And that's when these are active. So basically you have this VCC here in ground and it's divided in thirds. And this is the threshold zone and this is the trigger zone and this is the stuff zone. When the voltage falls, it's triggering. When the voltage rises, it's reaching its threshold. Now, what does that mean? It depends on which configuration, what you're doing with the chip. We'll go over that for each of the different uses of the chip. For right now, all we care about is there's two comparators and that's when they're on and off. Don't worry about why. Now there's another sneaky pin. It's called control. We'll call it C-O-N-T for control. That connects here to the two thirds point. Control is a way for you to override this voltage divider. So normally the voltage divider is just between the positive and negative voltages, the VCC and ground. But if you put a voltage on control, then instead of doing that, it says, okay, this point is control. So this point, this voltage is control. And this voltage here is half control. So threshold will be compared to the voltage you're putting in on control. And trigger will be compared to half of that because now we've got a two resistor voltage divider. This resistor is just doing whatever it's doing. It might be dumping current this way or this way based on the difference between VCC and control. But control is shorted directly into this spot. Whereas between VCC and this spot is a resistor. So the resistor is going to have a voltage drop and control is just going to apply directly. And you can do your Kirchhoff loops here to confirm it if you really want to. But basically the resistor is going to be doing something, but that's just shunting the difference between VCC and control. So if you were to apply two thirds of VCC, like if VCC was three volts, then normally this would be two volts and this would be one volt. Two thirds of three is two and one third of three is one. If you applied two volts to the control, then you would have two volts here and then half of two is one. So you'd have the same thing. So it's just a way for certain configurations to override what's going on here live. So you have the same supply voltage all the time, but you can have a different control voltage, which changes how the comparators work without changing the supply. This allows you to do fancy things like pulse width modulation. We'll get to that in the future. Right now, all you need to know is this is an override for the voltage divider. So you can separate the supply voltage from the comparator voltages if you want. That's five out of eight pins already. We're doing pretty good. So now we have the trickiest bit. We have a latch, which is going to be called a flip-flop. It's called a flip-flop all over the place. It has no enable signal and no clock signal. It's a latch. You see the word flip-flop just, it's like seeing ground when it's not ground. We just call it ground, move on. It's a three input SR latch. We've got R1, R2, and S, and you've got your Q out. If you don't know how an SR flip-flop or latch works, go check out 
my videos on the topic. Quick summary, a flip-flopper latch stores a bit. When you're not giving it inputs, it's always outputting the same bit, no matter what, either a high or a low one or a zero. Set sets the output to one, high. Reset sets the output to zero, low. So we have a pin. We have the reset pin. Let's contain our surprise. This is usually drawn as with a bar over it that indicates active low. Normally we say that zero or low is false and one or high is true. But for this one, when you don't want to reset, you give it a high. When you do want to reset, you give it a low. I don't know why it's like that. It's just works out better for the circuitry that way. So our active low reset goes here. Whenever you give a low to reset, no matter what anything else in the entire circuit is doing, your output is going to be low. The timer is going to be off. So it's a reset and a disable. If this reset is low, it's going to be off. Now, according to Wikipedia, some manufacturers do weird things with the reset signal. It's supposed to just reset the thing. It's supposed to just turn it off while reset is low. If it doesn't, check your data sheet and figure out why the person who made your chip is silly. But the reset is supposed to just reset. This comparator goes to reset. This comparator goes to set. And thus the true magic of this timer. When trigger voltage falls below the spot, which could be one third of VCC or one half a control. When trigger voltage falls below that voltage, this is going to output a high, which means set. It's going to go, and I forgot. Let me go ahead and draw a little not line on there too. Because this is a one for on, this is a one for on, this is a zero for on, that one's reversed. So when trigger voltage is below this point, this is outputting a high, which is giving it a set signal, which turns Q, the output, on. When threshold is higher than this point, so two thirds of VCC or the control voltage, when it's higher, this is outputting a high, which resets the flip-flop, the latch, and your timer goes low. Voltage goes below trigger. Voltage on the trigger pin goes below the trigger comparator voltage. Your output is turned on, triggers. When the voltage on threshold goes above the threshold comparator voltage, this turns on and your timer turns off. On, off, on, off, on, off. Just like that. Now what happens if you have both of these on at the same time? Don't do that. That's not how it works. I'm not even gonna worry about what happens in that case because it's gonna depend on your chip and it's not gonna do anything useful. We'll go over again, I'll go over all the different ways to hook up this chip, but assume that only this one or this one is going to be active. So it'll be set or it'll be reset. And remember, this is not a clock signal. This is not an enable signal. It just shuts the thing down. So that's the magic. There's a little latch in there. So now we have another pin. It's called out. I will give you one guess what out does. That's your output. So whatever is stored in this latch, that's the output to your chip. So when the voltage on trigger is below this, your output is high. When the voltage on threshold is higher than this, your output is low. Output is high, output is low, output is high, output is low. Now the output, if you recall, I did a video on a push-pull output stage. This is why. In order to separate the internal workings of this from the output, there is a push-pull amplifier on the output of this, which also increases the power that it can source or sync. I've seen references to 200 milliamps or so, but check your data sheet. So you can put whatever load you want on out, as long as it's not taking or putting in too much power current and the chip will just keep on going its merry way. So it's working as both a power amplifier and a buffer. A buffer is just something that separates the signal. I think I went over that in the logic video. The buffer just separates the workings from the actual outputs. So you don't have to worry about accidentally changing how the circuit works by putting too much of a power draw on the output. So there's your output, nice and simple. Now, let me add one little thing. Let me add Q0. Once again, you may recall from the latch and flip-flop videos, for SR, you've got Q and Q0. It's just the opposite. When Q is high, Q0 is low. When Q is low, Q0 is high. It's the same output, just inverted. And then we have a transistor. For example, a BJT, and I'm going to put it over here. Hooked up, the inverted output goes to the base to turn the transistor on and off, and the emitter, if it's a BJT, connects directly to ground. This is called discharge. And that is our final pin. That's all eight pins. The discharge transistor is what's called an open collector or open drain output. We've gone over this before. I have a video on it. Go look it up if you don't know what I mean. When the output is high, meaning the timer is active, this transistor is closed. It's not giving 
a low voltage, it's closed. So it's essentially a floating output. You don't want to hook up logic to discharge. The idea of discharge is you hook up a capacitor or a load to it that you want to be active and then just cut off. So it's not about a signal. It doesn't give a signal. It allows power through or not. When Q is low, when the timer is putting out a low signal, so out is low, Q not is high, so discharge opens. So when your timer is on and active, it's putting out an on signal, this discharge transistor is closed. When the timer stops and it says it's low, then the transistor opens and your discharge will discharge. That's why it's called discharge. It's meant to discharge a capacitor, but you can use it for other things. It's connected to ground. And that's it. So simple. All you need in order to make this device, resistors, op amps, they're very cheap. You get a pack of them on Amazon for nothing. A flip-flop or latch. If you're using a flip-flop, like if you have a flip-flop chip, you just, you know, tie your enable to high to make it into a latch. But if we're being fundamental here, it's NAND gates, remember? You just need a couple NAND gates. Those, I argue, are fundamental. You can make them with transistors, or you can use chips. In either case, the NAND gate is also a fundamental. And I would say the inverter is as well. The inverter is just a NAND with two inputs tied together. But if you want to be fussy about it, we can just say NANDs. So this is just a couple NAND gates. That's all. And then you just need a transistor there to do your discharge. And then for your push-pull output is just one more op amp. Again, I've done a video. Go watch the video. It's one more op amp and a couple more transistors. Resistors, transistors, and op amps. That's it. And you make your own. So future videos will have all the different ways you can use this chip. This is just how it works. Let's go over it again. Your VCC and ground is just your, your normal circuit power and your circuit ground. This is a voltage divider. All three of these resistors are equal in value. So this is two-thirds and this is one-third of VCC or VDD. Control is an override. You can put a voltage here so you'll have control and half control if you want. Otherwise, you just hook up control to ground to here with a capacitor. And that just shuts control down and you can ignore it. Reset turns your timer off. You can clear the timer anytime you want, no matter what's going on with reset. If you don't want to do that, you connect reset directly to VCC, and that shuts down that pin. So you just don't have to worry about it. Then you have your two comparators. This one turns on when the trigger pin is at a lower voltage than the trigger spot. This one turns on when the threshold pin is at a greater voltage than the threshold spot. Those are the set and reset of your latch that stores the bit that's turning on and off your timer. The output is just what bit is in here, high or low, and the discharge is an open collector or open drain output meant for discharging a capacitor or running a load, not for giving a signal, and that's the opposite of the output. Output is on, discharge is off. Output is off, discharge is on, and that's it. Incredibly simple and incredibly cool. So there's your basics. Now get ready to put theory into practice. I'm excited, and I'll be seeing you.